From Fathead Studios in Speedway, Indiana, this is The Skinny. And guys, I'm Ken Stout. Welcome to The Skinny. We have a huge show coming your way today. One of the best journalists in our modern day racing era, if you will, has decided to join us. Just came over after having lunch. He has a lunch on Friday with some of the biggest names in the history of the game. But this guy named Robin Lee Miller has come in, courtesy <laughs> of Rob Klepper, I might add, because he didn't return my message whenever I sent him on December 21st, but he will one day. Of course, Rico Elmore is with us. Rob Klepper is with us. And Robin Miller, thanks for making time, man. Ken, it was not a slight. I just, I'm not really good on computers yet. I'm 70 years old. I'm well, it challenged. Was a, yeah, it was a in, phone, but. In his oh. defense, he did tell me, he said, hey, when, when Friday rolls around, you got to remind me. You yes. got to remind me. He says, I'm getting old. You got to remind me. So I made sure I reminded him, and he sent back the emoji thumbs up, so I knew we were good. But I didn't know we were coming to a, like a $50 million studio. <laughs> this is like, are you kidding me? I love that. Pretty sweet, huh? Rico must have hit the lottery. This is uh, this and then is, spin it, right? This is Amazon. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> I mean, it's as nice a studio as I've ever seen. It's beautiful stuff. So we've had already had some really big name guests uh, on the skinny, and I thought in uh, since we didn't really do it on the first one, we kind of assume everybody knows who these guys are when we come in here, and I think our audience for the most part does. But since this is going out to Facebook and uh, a lot of people that might not know. Why not come up with a couple of your credentials along the way as you worked for the Indianapolis Star for 33 years. And I love the part when you got your first job at, at the Speedway, you were a stooge. I don't know. Has that changed at all? Are no, you still a stooge? I, I, I'm actually dumber now than I was in 1968. <laughs> Jim Herdebees was my hero, and I would go to the sprint car and, and stock car races at the fairgrounds and the Raceway Park, and I heard that he liked beer, so I'd steal beer, and I'd give it to him in the hopes that he would... Maybe someday recognize my face and maybe my name some decade, and I'd give him beer while I was standing outside the garage in '68, cutting school. And Herc walked in, and I said, "Hi, Herc." And he's like, "Hey, hey, hey, what are you doing?" I said, "I'm just." He goes, "You want to you want to help me for a week?" Well, I mean, that was my life was just completed. It help you, yeah. I mean, he had, that was when it was three weeks of practice. So Pete heard of bees and the crew hadn't come in yet, so it was me and another college kid and Jim, and that was the three of us. And uh, my job was to run the pit board, help push the car, put tape over his uh, goggles on his helmet, and don't touch any tools because I was such an idiot. And I got fired because I ruined the paint job. Uh, I taped his goggles onto his helmet once with a bunch of hair sticking out because I got nervous. And he pulled his goggles off and ripped his hair off. So I was free help when I got fired. And so I cut school and he made the race. The last roadster to make the race was in 1968, and that was that year. It was Jim, and he made it on Monday, the extra day of qualifying. And I cut school, and I was over by the fence and cheering for him, and he gave me the big wave over to come over the fence and get a qualifying picture, but I got drugged back by the, the guards. I, I wasn't allowed. But then I became friends with him and covered him and wrote about him at the Star, and it all came full circle. But if you guys could have seen him in 1960 at Terre Haute in a sprint car, you, you'd just take your breath away. It was unbelievable. So that he's the one that hooked me. And then, uh, and then you followed up with Chief Mechanic Bill Finley, who was uh, he had some great words to say about you, too, and your mechanical abilities. He told me once, he said, don't take this wrong, kid, but you're the dumbest human being I've ever seen around a race car. <laughs> he, he gave me a piece of metal to cut once, and it was a bandsaw, and I was just getting ready to cut both my thumbs off when he turned it off, and he goes, what, do you see what you're doing there? <laughs> oh, yeah, thanks, Bill. For not but, I mean, at the worst day of his life, you know, I, I stooged on his crew, and I was the vent guy on pit stops. And uh, he was so generous with his time. And, well, not just me, but you, it didn't matter who you were, Kenny. If you had a sprint car midget or anything, he would help you. He, he, the guys would just walk in. And, and Finley built his own Indy car in his garage behind his house with his own two hands and made the Indy 500 in those cars. Isn't that awesome? Johnny Parsons, Bentley Warren, uh, it, unbelievable. And he was just, you know, he told me once, he goes, I'm not this nice to my kids. Why do I help you? I said, charity case. <laughs> Describe him as without a mechanical bone in his body. Yes. He said, you should never own a race car. You, sh you can barely start a car. You should never own your own race car. Is it, is it, it then, then when you decided that 
You wanted to drive a race car? So, no, so I, then he goes to Andy Granatelli in 1972 and buys his first race car. Right. <laughs> Listen to after, that advice. After Finley's <laughs> advice, Art Pollard helped me get a, a Formula Ford from Andy Granatelli. It was painted day glow orange. And I ran about seven or eight races before I tore it in half at Watkins Glen. But I ate lunch every day with Vukovic, Bentonhausen, Parsons, and all the USAC guys. And they said, look, if you want to learn how to drive a race car and you're really serious, get rid of that squat to pee racer and go get a sprint car or midget. So I bought a midget from Gary Bentonhausen. It was the car Murrow made his comeback on after Murrow lost his arm at Michigan in the IndyCar race. Although they didn't really lose his arm. It was in the middle of the groove. They found his arm, but they say he lost his arm. <laughs> it just was no longer It was attached. just no longer on his body. So I'm running. I become the... The fourth Bentonhausen brother. So Gary gets to order me around and scream at me and everything. And and I had a, a Bentonhausen midget, and uh, it was a wonderful little car. And um, I had that for like five years. And then I bought Gary Stanton, sold me his very first midget. Stanton had great sprint cars, and he sold me his very first midget. And I drove him nuts. I'd call him every day. Hey, how's my car? He goes, if you call me one more time, you're not going to have a car because I'll stop working on it. What do you mean, how's it going? You'll get it when it's done. You know, oh, sorry. So I had, a, I had a really good stint midget, and I drove that until I got about $100,000 in debt. And um, it, it was the greatest eight years of my life because you learned so much about yourself and about racing. And in those days, the first time I went to Kokomo, I made the feature, and there were 13 guys out of 20 starters were in that year's Indy 500. So these guys I've been writing about in the star, I'm suddenly on a racetrack with. And my whole goal was... Jeez, don't kill somebody. Don't get in their way. This is how they make their living. So you just want them to respect you. So I got so I was at, to quote Jim McGee, you were a half-ass driver. That's probably a good <laughs> term. I had some good moments and some bad, but uh, never trade a moment of what, that was just the greatest. The USAC, in those days, in the 70s, it was, you just look back at the, at the guys that were running midgets. It was amazing. So you have a good run there in that midgets you were talking about, but your, your best race to date, inside of the midget, was the Hut 100. Oh, yeah. Oh, by far. Qualified fifth out of 93 cars. I I mean, you said the guy said you were a half-assed driver. That must have been, you must have been sitting on the right side of your ass <laughs> that day. I had been the first alternate the year before. I was 34th fastest out of 102 the year before. Well, you might as well be 84th fastest because you're going home. There was no semi. There was no hooligan. There was no heat races. So when I went out to qualify in 80, Willie Davis, bless his heart, was the USAC official sitting on my right front tire. And he goes, how's it going, Birdman? I go, you better fire up the ambulance and the record court because I ain't going to be first alternate. He goes, calm down, Birdman. I said, I'm as calm as I can be. I'm just telling you. <laughs> Nobody had made the race in about 30 minutes because the cushion was gone. It was like this far from the fence. And Joe Saldana and Steve Chassie said, the only way you're going to make this thing is to run it wide open against the fence. You just got to do it. So I did. And I was – so I came down a straightaway and sleepy trip. And the guy there, they were – they were pretty happy for me. So I pulled in, and the first thing is Gary Bentonhausen came down and goes, spit in my hand. I go, what? He goes, drug test. Who was in that, <laughs> who was in that, who was in that car? I said, that was me, schmuck. You know, so then before the race started, you know, so you got Poncho and Vo you got all these badasses behind me. And so Poncho comes up, and he says, what side do you want me to pass you on at the start? And I said, I don't care what. But I actually passed Johnny Parsons for third, like on about the sixth lap. And it was the very first race ESPN ever televised. And Bob, I remember Bob Jenkins and, and Larry Newber saying, geez, uh, I don't know what's gotten into Robin Miller. He's never run this good before. What? <laughs> that's, there that's it is right a, there. That's such a beautiful car. Look at that. And Ken. I see it. Yeah. That was qualifying. And so it, it, I, I passed JP, and then he gave me the world's most horrendous slide job to get third place back because I knew it made him crazy. And then it, it finally it blew up. But... Uh, what you guys know, because you've been around racing your whole life, is that is there's something about um, you can't explain to people what dirt racing is like. But there's I, I, I keep telling Scott Dixon and Joseph Newgarden and, and Will Power and guys like this, man, you guys got to try a mid year to sprint car in the dirt sometime because Connor Daly's done it. And now, you know, we're going to have James Davison and, and we're going to have uh, Santino Ferrucci at the Chili Bowl. So they're all IndyCar guys going to try the dirt. Santino was built. To run a midget. Yes. I mean, perfect. And he hot lapped a sprint car the other day. At, yeah, they both tested at Canyon, out west. At Canyon? At Canyon, yeah. For, and uh, they and, ran, and uh, did, did a pretty car. nice job. Because you guys and, know. I mean, and Mon Dave, Davison has the right frame of mind. Yeah. He doesn't care. No, he does not care. But the guy that would have been the sprint car driver for the ages would have been Montoya. And I had him all set up with uh, Kevin Thomas's sprint car school. And Ganassi found out and put the kibosh on it. Because... You know, <laughs> 
Montoya would have been, uh, he, he lived to be crossed up. But there was just something cool about, you know, I think when you get to race and, and you get to be, you know, how I lived with Larry Rice, he was my landlord, and that's all I did. I wrote about it 52 weeks a year in the Star, and I got to go racing, you know, five months a year in USAC, and, and uh, nobody had, a, had it better than I did. I mean, it was everything I could have ever imagined. So Larry Rice invites me to one of your lunches. It was at the Workman, Working Man's Pub. Uh, obviously, a number of years ago, and I worked. I had the pleasure of working with Larry for a number of years before he passed. Just absolutely wonderful guy. But I remember him telling me on 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 the way to this lunch. He said, "I'm going to go over here and go to lunch with Robin Miller." He said, "I've known him for a long, long time." He said, "You just got to remember, as soon as he says this is off the record, it's really not off the record because <laughs> it'll be printed in the next day." He said he's pissed everybody off somewhere along the way by doing that same exact deal. <laughs> But I, I, I'll never forget him. And he was dead serious. He's like, I love this guy, but, man, he has pissed me off sometimes. Oh, I got him in trouble at Pocono when they ran the dirt cars with the Indy cars in 81, AJ's last win. And I, Larry was talking about he was in the – he was going to run a dirt car against an Indy car, and he knew how insane it was. So I used a couple of his quotes, and he, got, he was all pissed off at me for a while. He got over it because my rent check was on time, and it cleared. But I'll tell you what, <laughs> there's a guy that was so underrated as a race driver. What a, he was co-rookie of the year with Rick Mears in 1978. Yep. And USAC midget champ and ran one sprint car races with a dirt car champ, won the Hoosier 100. He just the most humble, nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. So soft-spoken. You wonder where the aggression came from in the race car. Oh, he had a Vega, and we used to drive. We'd be driving down the interstate. He'd be going 53 miles an hour, and you'd go, hey, rookie of the year. Let's go 60 anyway. <laughs> Pick up the pace. What are we doing? But it was Larry Rice, Chuck Gurney, myself, Mark Alderson lived in the driveway in a motorhome, and Larry McCoy, who drove Indy cars, lived upstairs. It was, and then the bike, the bikers would show up, the AMA guys, Palm Grinner, Romero, and 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 uh, and Aldana, and they'd then they'd sleep on the floor. I mean, it was the YMCA for racing. You have no idea who was going to be there. <laughs> the first time I worked, well, no, I take that back. Not the first time I worked with him. I'd worked with him for a couple of years. Larry Rice, I'm talking about on TV, and we did. The Chili Bowl in 08. And I am used to working with a docile. I worked with him a lot in short course off-road. That's where he was. And um, and we did a little bit of other stuff as well that he wasn't really familiar with. I mean, he, kind of, he knew short course, but some of the other stuff that we, we had been doing, he just took the job and he did as good as he could do. He'd never driven one. So we're doing the Chili Bowl. We have 08 Chili Bowl coming up, HBO pay-per-view. It was, it was myself and it was Larry. It was a four man four man booth, if you will. It was you, uh, Larry Rice, Pat Dave, Sullivan, and Dave Argerbright, Dave Argerbright all on and, the stage, and then and myself I and Matt Yoakum in the pits. Dave Argerbright was supposed to be my right hand man. Like I, I was, I was host. I was a traffic director, if you will, and I I needed to go right to Argerbright with almost everything. And then I had, <laughs> I had Larry on my right, and then Pat was down the other other end of the desk. Well, as it turns out, once they said we're on and we go live and the guys start racing. Well, Argerbright is a soft-spoken, his delivery is just a little softer, a little smoother, a little slower. Great guy, does an awesome job. But all of a sudden, holy ish, Larry Rice shows up. And I mean, dude, he was on the gas. I'm like, who is this guy? I've worked with you for two or three years, but now we were talking about midgets. And he knew midgets, and he got excited, man. And we were at the Chili Bowl, and he was just wound tight. And it ended up being myself and him all night long, bantering back. And, of course, the other two guys had great stuff to fill in, but Larry Rice just was absolutely on fire. And I was like, holy smokes, that's why they have this guy doing TV. I mean, that's, he was in. When he did Thursday Night Thunder, we would sit around going, who is this? This is, you know, Rice would have a couple beers and fall asleep in his chair with a smile on his face at night before he got married. I mean, he was docile, was a really good, the most calm guy, and never got his, never raised his voice. Well, except when Mark Alderson tried to turn his basement into a speed shop. He got mad about that. But that was all. <laughs> Bless his heart. Well, I just think a lot of people, I mean, obviously you're many, many years of journalism now currently covering IndyCar. For those that are not familiar with what Robin does today, he actually does cover IndyCar. They still have you on pit road. You've, you've been the best bobber and weaver in the industry, I think, of anybody. No matter how many times <laughs> it looks like you're going to be out, you end up back in. It, it's been amazing, but you do a phenomenal job. And I think everybody loves it because what you've always done is brought the truth 
and you never really cared about who you pissed off. He was not politically correct. No, no. he was cool. And you know what? The show that was made for me, I mean, RPM Tonight, I worked at ESPN for about six years, and RPM Tonight was great because they gave me Wednesday for, for USAC and, and CART at, at that time, and it was cool. But when I got to work for Speed and, and Dave Despain, I got to be on Wind Tunnel and co-host it with him like 30 times. That was the greatest racing show because it covered – the spectrum of racing, everybody, motorcycles, off-road, stock cars, midgets, sprints, dragsters. But there was never any, only once they said, quit making fun of NASCAR, okay? We got a lot of NASCAR fans, so get off of the NASCAR's ass. But no one ever said, you can't say this or you can't do this. And it was, and Dave Despain, it's, it, he's the best yeah. ever. Yeah. You talk about a guy that doesn't need it. You know, you guys have all done it. He doesn't need a teleprompter, and you can't tell when he's reading off a teleprompter. He's that good. Yeah. Because one night I hosted it. James Hinchcliffe and I hosted. Dave was riding his motorcycle, and they had me host it. And Hinch is is going to be. He'll end up working for NBC, and he'll be the best analyst you've ever seen. He was made for television. But we were doing the show, and I tried reading the teleprompter the first. You know, before the first break, and the guy behind the camera says, "Man, just don't. It's awful. Don't read it." You know. <laughs> and after the second segment, they just said, do "Why thing. don't you let Hinchcliffe <laughs> host the show? Let Hinchcliffe host the show, and you be the guest." Oh, that's nice. Yeah. So he Hinchcliffe, he always reminds me of that. But uh, that was such a. I just kept thinking, you know, you guys have maybe the type of a, someday there's going to be a show like that again. I think on on weekly television. I don't know where, but. There's an audience for it. We had a great audience at Wind Tunnel. Gr- I mean, and big it was, time. It was a great program. And they I mean, made it, money. It yeah. made money, Rico. What, so why God. did it go away? Why do you think? Fox bought, when Fox bought everything, they, they bought, just they they shut it studio. down. They, mm-hmm. they, you should see the studio they built for it. It was awesome. Was it like this? It was. <laughs> this was pretty damn close. I mean, a little yeah. bigger than this. But think about all the yeah. people that went through there, and they had the yeah. NASCAR shows and stuff. And if they'd have just kept the show going, instead they spent millions of dollars and they started their own sports show at night that yeah. nobody watched nope. that went away about eight months later. Yeah. And Wind Tunnel and, and Speed and Speed Report would have been the two shows they could have just plugged in and, and done forever. So you're talking about Hinchcliffe. I got an interesting story. So Hinchcliffe works out at a place called Pit Fit. Right. Jim, Jim Leo, right? So Jim's a good friend, and I know with my physique, it's hard to believe that I would work out there as well. You look I great. Can... Your hair looks perfect. Thank you. It does look good. <laughs> Your hair does look good. It's about all I got going for me, but anyhow. So, you know, the thing of it is, is, you know, Hinchcliffe and all those guys would be in there working out and the other pit crews and stuff. So I got to know all these guys pretty good, you know, Dixon and all these guys. And when Hinchcliffe got hurt at the Speedway, I went to um, I went to Ellen Saul, which is who we deal with through our suite and all that stuff. And I told her, I said, you guys need to do something for first responders. You guys need to have a day for first responders. And it needs to be about this, okay? Because at the end of the day, that guy saved his life. They saved his life. On the track. I mean, he mm-hmm. saved his life in that car. He was gone. And I said, they. I, it gives me chills talking about it, but I said, they saved his life. And this kind of stuff happens every day out, on the, out in the real world, not here at this track, but in the real world. I said, so you have this event, and and you have you know, police, fire, you know, uh, you know, EMS and all these guys. I said, what do the fire companies like to do best? Well, they like to have a chili cook off. I mean, at the end, I mean, give me a break. Either they're playing cards, working uh, their schedule for their lawn mowing service, or they're fixing chili or something. So my fireman friend, sorry, (laughs) but you know, so have a day where they have a firehouse out there. So We've kind of got it going, and, and, you know, that kind of brings me into the next thing that we were talking about was Mr. Penske taking over. And, I mean, I I, I love it. Just don't tear down turn two suites. That's our place. He, he's, it's the, Bobby Unson and I were talking the other day. It's the best thing that's ever happened in our lifetime to racing because of what – I mean, I've talked to RP about five times in the last three weeks because I'll send him an email from a fan. Hey, I've been going to the race for 50 years. Please – I can't tell who's leading the race. They took away my little crawl. We need it. So Roger, man, he responds like two minutes later. 
you know, it's at midnight every Sunday night. That's when we, I said, shouldn't you be going to bed about now? He goes, I'll get my four hours. I don't need to be in bed. He sleeps four hours a night. That's it. I could see it. But he's got so many ideas about what he's, and I'll tell you what, he'll find a third engine manufacturer. And it'll be somebody big like Ford or Toyota. He'll find more money for the purse and it'll be where it should be. And he'll, he'll do, he'll help. I think he'll help the IndyCar purse as well, which are a joke, but he's just, He's so invigorated about this whole thing. It's like I was talking to Tim Sendrick there. He goes, he's an 82-year-old man. He's like a 12-year-old kid. It's so ex- He's so blown away that it's his that he gets to shape it the way he wants to. And you know what? I gave Tony George a lot of grief in the IRL days, but I've been the first guy to say in the last two months, he's the one that went to Mark Miles and said, we need to offer this to Roger Penske. we got people bidding on it, but we got to make sure he gets a chance because he would be the guy I'd want. And – Good for Tony because I think it was it, it worked out to be perfect. What do you get an eighty-two year old millionaire that has everything? That's that's billionaire. You know, I mean, and 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 him get excited about it, I right? Mean, there's probably not many things on this planet that would excite him anymore. You know, I mean, he's done it all. And 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 Robin, you know best. I mean, his uh, the my understanding was he was more than upset after he let Michigan go, right? After it was over with. Well, I think so, but he made so much money. I mean, he did. Right. He got rid of Fontana and Michigan and Net all at the perfect time. If right. you look back at it, right. But he's so because I, when this whole thing happened, you're thinking, you know, he's 82 years old. He flies to Japan, Australia, New Zealand, England, all the time. He's on a plane all the time, and he's got 68,000 people working for him or something like that. He's not going to have time to run a racetrack, but the speed, Speedway supersedes everything else because that's his whole life, and that's what he's built his business around. And and so, yeah, I don't know. He, I never heard him say. He, he, I never heard him talk about the regrets that he had. But he made Michigan a first class track, just like Fontana. Everybody had a parking place. The fans were taken care of. The suites were. I mean, it was. And I think what's going to happen here is there's not going to be more dirt parking out here at the Speedway. And the re- he said to me the other day, he says, "You know how many restrooms they got in the Speedway?" I said. <laughs> RP, I got no idea. He goes, 166. He says, you know how many of them need help? I said, 165. He said, close. <laughs> so we're gonna have we're gonna have new restrooms, and you're gonna have. I think Are they bringing the well, troughs back? Of, I was gonna say, there's oh. plenty of room to stand in those 166. If you don't mind being arm to arm with with your buddy there, that's. You know, it, remember the old so trough. You can play swords if you want. You know, it's a, <laughs> the trough. Yeah, that was nice, wasn't it? The trough. Oh my hey, God. you mind looking away here for about three minutes? Yeah, uh, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> but he's he. It's the. You know, Rico, it's the only thing in my 50 years of covering racing that I've not heard one person complain about. I've yeah. never heard such a positive reaction to something. It's like everybody. Yeah. This is great. God, this is going to be great, you know. Yeah. Because I think people know how much it means to him. Yeah. I'm the same way. I want the best thing for the track. I want the best. You know, we bring people out there all year. We have 24-7 access. We go downtown to a dinner. It's on a... a uh, you know, a summer night, you know, we go out there and, you know, watch the sunset or, or set out there and just look at the place and just breathe it in. Yeah. And I mean, that's, there's a lot of people that are missing that, that need to, need to get that back. And, and I got to tell you, it seems like after the hundredth kind of moving forward, it seems like it's a lot different feel out there, which is, you know, I'll give some credit to Tony and those guys. And, and listen, like I said about the Holman George family, man, this has been their life all their life. Sure, you know, and at some point, it's kind of like I give. You know, I mean, it's a it's a lot. You just, it's and, still the most spectacular. I mean, we'll, we'll sit. We can sit here and pick it apart. No, it's but the best when you're ever. there on race day. I mean, I get goosebumps now. Yeah, but it's the most spectacular thing I've ever seen. I've had the pleasure of of spotting for Andretti Autosport uh, Autosport the past couple of years and being on top of turn one up there where the spotters are and looking down on all the opening ceremonies and seeing the massive amount of people walking around and everything that's going on, it's just awe-inspiring. And and there's really no words to describe it. You have to be there. It has to be a bucket list list item. You've got to get out there and see it it and feel it. It's just absolutely incredible. And and to what you said before, after the race is over, I've sat up there on that crow's nest 
and let everybody go away and just I know, sat there and I know, looked. You know? I know you usually call me to I pick do. your ass you know, up I'll and sit take up there you to your and car. Smoke, I'll sit up there and smoke a cigar and just watch everybody because it's – how many times do you get to do yeah. this in a lifetime? It's yeah. just yep. it's just incredible. You got one of the great seats of all times too. God, that's a great seat. It's unbelievable. And, and the flyover this last year, the best yet. <laughs> It's where just, that dude took two laps. <laughs> you know, it always, what always, what always he missed gets, it the first time. <laughs> what always gets me is they've been running these commercials, the Great American Race, and I'm like, give me a break. Yeah, right. The Great American Race is in May. Yeah, and it ain't Charlotte. It's the Indianapolis 500. It always has been. It always will be. Yeah, Daytona's okay, but it 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 is doesn't even it it it's not a wouldn't make a zit on the speedways. But right, sorry, right. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's just, it's an incredible, incredible day. What a happening it is every time. And to say that you've won that thing. I mean, I, w- I was tickled pink. We finished seventh. We started off 21st, finished seventh. I thought we'd won the thing. I mean, sure. it's, well, it's an it, amazing run. But it is, that is, there's just different victories. I mean, Kyle Kaiser made the race last year and McLaren didn't. So that was a victory. Right. That was yeah. like winning the race. For sure. You know. Some big dogs in there that, that, have, that have not made the call. By the way, talking about Dave Despain being the best ever, and you bring it up, Bill Simpson. I want to throw a quick shout out for the people that aren't aware of it. Bob Varsh is in, in some serious trouble here. And I know he has a GoFundMe page. So if you can take a moment, look that up. Um, Bob Varsh needs our help. Talk to, and, I talked to Bobby a couple. Certainly one of the best of all talked time. Talked to him a couple days ago. And he's very, he's a private person like a lot of us. But he, I think he was very reluctant to ask for any help. And Marshall Pruitt from Racer really yes. pushed it and said, yes. Bob. The bills my wife have are staggering. You need some help, and I think they've raised almost seventy-five grand already. I think it's is it pancreatic right yeah. cancer, yeah. prostate, yeah, prostate. But prostate. it's the, but he's going to Duke, and he's got some he's got some pretty good people. The Duke's got a really good uh, reputation in this area. So oh, seventy-four thousand, that's yeah. cool. A brilliant, a brilliant guy. One of the first guys when I first got in this industry, I picked up the phone and called him, and he answered the phone, talked to me. As if he had known me for 15 sure. years, took the time to help me out, get me going. Just an out, outstanding individual. Yep. He, he called a drag race. I think it was him and Ted Jones called a drag race <laughs> with no video. I don't know how long they did it, but they did it for like a, a round or two rounds. There was technical difficulties, if you will, and they could still hear. So they could hear the cars do the burnout, and they would know to talk. And they had approximate amount of time before they would line up. And then they'd hear him blast down the track and they would talk again. But they had no video for I don't know how long and, and continued to call the race. Yeah, drag racing's kind of visual. <laughs> yeah, well, I think all racing's kind of visual. You got to know when they're rolling into the lines there, you know? Yeah. Well, there has Perhaps. been on occasion where Stout and I are doing a voiceover and, and the screen will go dark. We'll still, hear it, we'll still hear it, but the screen will go dark. And we just keep going as if we could see everything. And we're waiting for, for the producer or engineer to go... Uh, can you guys see what's going on? Or we just keep going thinking it's going to come back. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. We just keep talking and thinking, ah, we're pretty close to what's going on on the yeah, racetrack. Yeah. Before we wrap this deal up with, with Miller here, you brought something up here when we were off camera. Getting the, Some of the best stuff, of course, always happens when you're off camera. Yeah, you guys need to have a, a highlight show of, of A the camera outtakes. running all the time. The as, soon as, as soon as you walk in the room, right? It's, just, it's just, rolling. just not like the one that Bobby Knight had when he had his golf oh. show. Did you <laughs> ever see the outtakes was, on oh, that? One, I mean, Sam Carmichael's a treasure. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, I can't hit this f-ing ball out of the sand. Don't tell me to stand closer to this. That was some of the best television ever. He was going ballistic. Yep. I mean, <laughs> but you had brought up. People flying, the racers flying, and yep. And, yep. and you jumped right in and said AJ Foyt learned how to fly his own plane, and and a couple of other guys that couldn't read the manual. How's that work? Uh, you know, the, was it United that said fly the friendly skies? They weren't friendly in the '60s because you had Herdebees, Parnelli, Foyt, McCluskey, Uncle Bobby, Ruby. Now I don't. I don't know that any of... I think McCluskey might have been the only one of the six that actually passed his written test. The rest of them either didn't take it or didn't pass it. Was it a written test for flying? Yes. Okay. <laughs> for flying. Sorry. A written test for flying. So one day, I'm at the star, and Herdebees calls me up, and he says, What are you doing? I said, ah, Not much, Ricky. Want to go to Cleveland with me and get some parts? I said, Yes. So I go out, and he had a CB. He had an old CB plane, you know, amphibious and Prince, his dog, is sitting in the as the co-pilot, and 
we push it. We have to push it out of this little hangar, and Herc fires it up, and there's a little blue smoke coming out of the engine. You're thinking, mm, well, it's okay. If I die, it doesn't matter. It's Jim Herderby's. I won't be part of the headline, but I'll die with my hero. It's okay. So we take off. His radio doesn't work, and we're flying along, and about 5,000 feet, and he pulls it down to about 2,500. What's that sign say? I said, Newcastle. Okay. <laughs> so we flew to Cleveland on the interstate. I mean, you know, you hear all these horror stories that, you know, my buddy Tony Bentonhausen got killed in a plane crash, and Alan Kowicki, and all the and Graham Hill, and you know, all the racing people that have lost their lives. And Tony Bentonhausen was as meticulous a pilot as I've ever, you know, he, he wasn't a daredevil. And yet here in the 60s were these crazy guys that, no roll cage, no fuel cell, not much of a helmet. They were pretty brave to start with. So flying an airplane, it was like, you know, what's the big deal? I mean, it, you pull up and the thing goes up and you come, you know, I mean, self-taught pilots. Yeah. As Uncle Bobby yeah. says, I'm a self-taught engineer, honey. Well, he that told, could be, but. He, to, he told me, he goes, he says, yeah, he goes, uh. He said, I won Pike's Peak that year, and he said, I uh, paid all my bills, and I had $3,000 left over. He goes, and I went and bought an airplane. I said, oh, wow, cool, so you, you, you became a pilot. He goes, oh, no, I never went and got my license. I just started flying. I was like, holy gosh, what do you mean you just started flying? He goes, oh, yeah, he goes, in this plane, he goes, he goes, you'd have to put oil in it and get in the plane and take off quick because the oil would start draining out of it because <laughs> it'd start flowing backwards until you got it up level and it wouldn't go out of it. I'm like, well, that sounds pretty dangerous. He <laughs> goes, he goes, oh no. He said, I was, he goes, I was, uh, he goes, I was racing out at, uh, out at Ascot for ag, you know, ag and he goes, I was racing out there for him. He goes, is either a 17 hour drive from Albuquerque or it was a seven-hour flight with one stop. He goes, so I was doing great. I got $300 to show up there. It was like $300 to risk your life. Yeah. Like he landed once, Rico, he landed once in Albuquerque, and it was like a 90-mile-an-hour crosswind or something like that. Ronnie Doss, who, who was at lunch today, and it was Howard Milliken's son and was a really helped Buddy Lazar win the Indy 596. Ronnie's a smart guy, and I think he might have been with him on this trip when he was like, 14 or 15, but Uncle Bobby kind of misjudged the interstate and the electric guy wires <laughs> and, and the hangar. And, you know, mad, mad, mad world where the guy goes under the hangar. Yeah. I think Unser did that. Barn bounced storming. bounced once and then came back out of the... <laughs> the fact that, that Unser is still alive, and any of those guys are... I mean, Parnelli said one day, Parnelli said, you know, he said racing was pretty dangerous back then he says but so was daily life with the uncers <laughs> i mean just trying to i heard they, they drove bored. the streetcars like a race car anytime you got in a car with them it was wide open you it couldn't was... you couldn't uh, in the mid 60s hertz and avis were the only two rental car companies in the united states in north america neither one of the uncers were allowed to rent a car because they destroyed so many cars we go to mossport once mossport's got this blind right hander so Bobby Unser talks Jerry Grant into renting a car for him in Jerry Grant's name. God rest his soul, Jerry Grant was a wonderful guy. And they were teammates. One and done. You learn your lesson so there, So right? <laughs> they go to the racetrack, and Unser takes the keys to Jerry Grant's cars and throws, throws them 100 yards away and jumps in his car and takes off. So Jerry Grant wants to, you know, he jumps in the car and takes off after Bobby and Al Unser. They go around the right-hander stop the car in the middle of the track sideways, and they both run over to the side. Jerry Grant comes over, the blind right-hander, pile drives, should have killed him. Pro I mean, you know, they didn't think about that. Broke the, broke the car in half, steam pouring out of the radiators, and they're laying on the ground laughing, and Grant's like, you, what, I can't. So not only is that bad enough, then they decide one of the cars was still salvageable, so they get another rented car, and they told Jerry, listen, We'll, we'll pay for it. Don't worry about that. But let's take this down. We'll tell them the other one was stolen. But we can get this one back. It's The wheels are still moving. You know, we got the front end bowed in. So Mossport's up on a hill, a mountain. And so they Grant gets in the car, and the Unsers are pushing him down this hill. And they're going 30, 40, 50. And he finally leaves the road, goes down an embankment. And thankfully, there's a bunch of trees that stopped him. Yeah, thankfully. They almost killed him twice in an hour. And Grant said, 
I, I, I had nobody to blame but myself. And I'm like, no, how could you be that stupid? You can't let the young Because he said he looked back in the rearview mirror, and they're laughing as they're going faster and faster. And, and he's trying to keep this thing on the road. But if you guys ever get to listen to Dinner with Racers, those, those two crazy guys that do that Dinner with Racers, I put them together with Unser, and it was a three-hour thing, and they had to edit it. They've never edited anything, and they said they've never laughed that hard. I said, he's an American original. There ain't nobody like him. But, you know, if you look at all those guys, fellas, they, they still never forgot where they came from, and they still know how to treat people. And fans feel like that, you know, I mean, Mario looks you in the face if you're a fan and shakes your hand and signs your autograph and Rutherford. And you know, AJ's not always the most amenable, but he... He has his moments when he's, you know, I don't want to go out there and sign. I said, AJ, these people have been out here for a half an hour. It's 85 degrees in the sun. Go sign it. You know, it's they're, they're your fans. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's a, it was a good era. I just, I used to tell Bob Harkey, he used to bitch because he didn't ever get to ride for Penske or Foyter. I said, Harkey, you made the Indy 500 when it mattered. There were 65 cars going for 33 spots. You lived in a great era. And I think... Rutherford and Uncle Bobby and Foyt, I think they all appreciate the era they were in and the era they thrived in. Thanks for watching this episode of The Skinny. Be sure to check out all the latest sun and optical eyewear at fatheads.com. Special thanks to our sponsorship partners at Elliott's Custom Trailers and Carts. This has been a production of Fathead Studios. Please remember to subscribe.